look at something here. Uh, I'm not sure if you ever heard or if I've ever heard anyone preach about it, but we will look at it tonight. And so beginning at Matthew chapter number 2, and uh, let's look at verse number 7. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Of course, we know that the intent of Herod was not to worship him, but to have him put to death. And when they heard these things, when they had heard the, the, uh, the king, uh, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not depart, uh, return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14, And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked, so we go back to this portion, verse 16, we, we go backwards. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And uh, so we, we come to this, this scripture and um, we're going to look at uh, in, in verse number uh, nine, verse number 16, what the Bible says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, the Bible says that he was exceeding wroth, he was exceeding angry, his, his passions were uh, out of control, and Herod was not the kind of man that you wanted to have that happen to. Uh, Herod was the kind of man, and we'll look at it in a minute, he was so wicked and vile, he didn't have to have a reason to kill you. He just liked to kill people. He liked to see people die. He was eaten up with death. He had no regard for life. I'll, I'll read you some stuff here later on to, to verify that. But uh, he was an ambassador of death. So it was not a big deal to Herod to have all these children killed. He, he just said, look, just go. And, and when it says under two years of age, they didn't have to be, they didn't get a birth certificate out. They didn't check. Anybody, any little child anywhere in that area that appeared to be two years of age or younger, uh, the male, any of them, uh, listen, uh, it, it just said, just, just take and kill them. Uh, someone would say it was male or female, whatever else. It just didn't matter. They didn't check. There was no regard. It was just simply uh, an, an utter uh, pronunciation of woe and death upon every child 
just in case one of them was baby Jesus. Now you think about that for just a minute. Uh, if you think back to the story of Abraham, whenever he took up his son Isaac up on the mountain, and he said, take your son, your, your only son, and, and offer him. And we know that just before Abraham pulled back the knife and before he took his own son's life, uh, the, the angel appeared and he stopped him and he said, There's a, behold the ram that was caught in the thicket. And uh, uh, Abraham said, had told his son that God would provide himself a lamb. And God did provide a lamb. He did provide a sacrifice. But you know, you take that story and flip it around to the, to the birth of Jesus. And you have here that Jesus being born. But instead of Jesus as a baby dying... Every little child, maybe there was one or two that was hidden, but we don't have an account of that. But every child that was born at the same time that Jesus was born was killed. Now think about that for a minute. Every little child, because of the rage and the jealousy of Herod, and that's not a new thing. If you go back and, and study and look in the Bible whenever Solomon the, the great wise, you know, Solomon. Whenever God said to Solomon, I'm through with you, your kingdom is, oh, it's, it's, you're done. God said, I'm going to raise up uh, 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 Jeroboam and um, I'm going to raise up uh, 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 an enemy. You know, Solomon said, I'll kill him. I'll just kill him. That's the answer. I'll just kill my enemy. And that's, why, that's the way it was with Jesus whenever he was born. Herod said, I'll just, I'll just kill him. And if I, can't, if I can't kill him, and just in case, I'm just going to go ahead and take a shot in the dark, and I'm going to kill every little baby in that area. I want to take those children from their mother's arms or from their father's care, and I'm going to have their throat cut. I'm going to have their head broken, their neck broken. I'm going to have them thrown in the river and drowned, stomped, whatever it was. He said, I just want you to go and kill every child that appears to be two years age or, age or younger. So when at the time when Jesus was born, every child in the nursery, every little boy, every little girl, that he would have played with as a little child. Every one of them was killed. And you think about that for a minute. I want to talk to you tonight about the significance of that. Look what the Bible says that came as that. It says, in Ramah there was a voice heard. Lamentation. And weeping. And great mourning. Think about that. Think about those words just for a minute. There was lamentation. And weeping in great mourning, Rachel being what? The women, the mothers of that region. And not one, not two, but every one. I mean, you talk about just a, a mass. If you know uh, the, the historian, Josephus doesn't even mention this story. Totally ignores this story. Why? Because it gives credence or evidence to the birth of Jesus. And so this story where this wicked, vile uh, Herod had every little child murdered. Can you think just for a minute? The Bible says that in Ramah there was a voice heard. Not many voices, but one voice. It's, it's as if to say they were in chorus, like a choir of lamentation, like a chorus of weeping. Every mother at the same time, and, and no doubt the fathers, however they dealt with their grief, but lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Now you understand that this, nothing happens that what God doesn't allow it to happen. And you look at that story, and you think, man, those, those mothers, and those fathers, and those families, they suffered great misery. But Jesus was spared. Because the angel warned him. Let me just play the devil's advocate for a minute. Could the Lord have not warned the others? Apparently not. It wasn't in the plan. So why would he allow Herod to do that? 
I'm going to tell you why. Lord willing, tonight I want to show you why. Why, why there was, at the, at the birth of Jesus, why there was, at the, as a child, why every little baby that was born at the time of his birth would die before their third birthday. And the Bible says that weeping and lamentation. Now think for a minute. Those were real babies and these are real families and this is real grief and real sorrow. And we serve a real God. And you know, God, God's greater than Herod. And God saved his son. He saved Jesus. He put in the ear of Joseph, get out of here. This man's a madman. But those others, they were left as setting ducks to die. You say, why in the world would he do that? Well, because I want you to understand something tonight, and I want us to think about it as I've thought on this lesson, that Jesus, believe it or not, didn't come to this earth to stop dying and death. He didn't come. His purpose on this earth, listen, before Jesus was ever born, people were already dying. You understand that we're going to look at the verse here tonight, but sin, but de death didn't come from God. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and so death by sin passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You say, but why does God allow dying? Because man asked for it. Man chose it. You see, the wages of sin, the payment for sin, is death. Now, we're going to look at it tonight. Jesus didn't come so that you could live forever here on this earth. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul prayed, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's an it's, it's amazing thing as Christians that we've forgotten the fact that we live in a body that, listen, every bad thought that I've ever had, I wish I could get rid of it, but you know what? They just keep recircling around and around and around and around. This mind, maybe your mind's perfect. Maybe you don't have any bad thoughts. But listen, and, and uh, the, the Apostle Paul said, you know what? I'm tired of it. I'm tired of this bondage. I'm tired of this corruption. 1 Corinthians 15 says this corruption, that's this body. This body, this corruption must put on incorruption. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, this mortal must put on immortality. And then we're going to look at the verses, but it's going to say that death is swallowed up in life. 1 Corinthians 15 is going to remind us that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You say, is death uh, uh, like, a, like a, an entity or like a, 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 a being? Yes, God talks about death. He says it's an enemy. He says that he's going to put death someday under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So we live in a, we live in a day and a time where literally there are even Christians and preachers will stand up and say, it. boy, we're going to protect you. We're going to keep you from dying. And the doctors, it's one thing to doctor, and it's one thing to provide medication, and it's one thing to try to help someone when they're in suffering and pain, and maybe even, maybe even God gives us a means to correct something or to make something better. But we live in a day and a time of a godless world and a godless generation that thinks that we can defy this book right here, and we can eradicate death. We can just get rid of it and wipe it out, and we can fix it so that no one ever has to die. That's not true. That's a lie of the devil. At the birth of Jesus, every little baby, every little child died. You say, I just don't think that's fair. Well, can I tell you where every one of them little children are tonight? Jesus didn't come so that we could live forever down here. He came and died on the cross so that we could have a home in heaven. 
He came and died so that we could have immortality. He came and died on the cross so that this corruption could put on incorruption. And so now those little children, and yes, they were in their prime. Yes, they were little babies. But tonight, right now, they walk the streets of glory. They've got a perfect glorified body. And every little child that's ever died or every aged person, that their body was sick and decayed and worn out. And man, we would like to just keep them forever. But you know what? Someday we're going to breathe our last breath. Someday this whole body will decay. It'll wear out. It'll not be able to take anymore. Someday this heart will draw its last breath. You say, but man, we serve a great God and God's able to save life. And you think about the story of Lazarus. And his sister said, if thou would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus did bring him back. And Jesus could have prevented him from dying. But Jesus didn't come to this earth so that you would miss your appointment with death someday. He came to this earth so that when your appointment with death comes, you'll be ready for eternity. That's why he came. That's what you and I are to be as Christians. We're not here to play this game, this foolish game of trying to convince people that they can prolong their life. You can't prolong your life. One single solitary moment past the day when God says, Come home. The Bible says it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Listen, there are folks dying tonight. Every, every second, someone somewhere is dying. They're dying on different continents. They're dying in our country, in our nation. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that the average lifespan of man, that we lost two years of life in the last year, down to 2.2. But in America, people live to be in their 80s and their 90s. But listen, the truth of the matter is, whether you live to be 100 or 120 or 150, someday you're going to die. It's a point that a man wants to die and after this the judgment. You say, why in the world would God have said to Joseph, take that baby? Why couldn't he have said to the other mothers and fathers? And there weren't a whole lot of them. I mean, he, he, could, have, he could have saved them. He could have all said, all oh, one night, all of you get out because Herod the madman is going to kill people. But as far as we know, none of the others were saved from Herod. The Bible does tell us that there was weeping and lamentation and great mourning. God could have stopped all that. So he's not a very good God. Yeah, he is a good God. He is a good God because that little baby that was saved, that little baby that was saved and sent down to Egypt and later on, listen, he wasn't saved so that he could miss death. He was saved so that he could keep his appointment with the cross. Amen. Because that same Jesus, whenever he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration and Abraham spoke to him and they spoke to him about his decease. Hey, about the time that was appointed for this cause came I into the world. So that I could go to the cross. So that I could shed my blood. So that I could pay the price for sin. So that death could be swallowed up in life. I wish tonight that I could get a hold of us as Christians, each and every one of us, and remind us that, listen, this old world down here, man, Christians are worried and they're afraid. And what are we going to do if this happens? And we're concerned about a bunch of stupid politicians and about a bunch of uh, uh, stuff that, man, listen, we ought not even be thinking about. Our home is in heaven. Amen. My name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And if you're saved tonight, your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And you'll not spend one second in hell. But when it's time down here to breathe your last breath, God's going to call you home. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. The song says our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You say, well, I just don't like that kind of a message. I don't like death either. I hate it. I don't like it. I didn't like it two years ago this morning whenever God took my little boy home to heaven. But you know where for two, the last two years down here, there's no time in heaven, but you know where my little boy's been for the last two years? He's been in the presence of God. Now, I think he was perfect when he was here, but that's because I'm, I'm slanted. And I wouldn't have changed a thing about him. But I know for sure tonight he's perfect. And I, and I know there's no nighttime in heaven. But I'm just telling you tonight, listen, I, if I could imagine, if I could go to where he is and if I could see him. 
I'd never want to be here another day. And tonight, if you could step over from this side and you could step over into heaven, the Apostle Paul didn't say that he saw things unlawful to be spoken. He said he heard things unlawful to be spoken. If we could just bend our ear and hear tonight the glory of God and the praise of heaven and the songs of the saints, if we could hear what we hear there, do you think we would ever be content to come back here and hear a bunch of politicians and a bunch of preachers that pre don't preach the Bible but just preach a bunch of nonsense? sense and a bunch of television nonsense brother listen if we could hear what they hear in heaven we wouldn't even ever want to open our ears again would be like little luke would do he'd plug our ears i don't want to hear it i've heard enough but you know those folks that die and going on to heaven they're already there and i don't want to name anybody tonight but you everybody here has suffered the loss of loved one and if you haven't you will and if your heart's never been ripped out, and if you never stood by the graveside and watched as the casket was lowered into the grave of your loved one, you will someday. And I'm not saying here tonight that I wish death on anybody, but I do wish as believers that we would change our attitude about it and realize that it's just a brief time that we say goodbye. If they're saved, we'll see them again in glory. But the problem tonight is if they're not saved, we're separated forever. And heaven is a land of eternal life. But hell is a place of eternal dying. And somehow or another, as Christians, we've got to get our focus back. Not on living this life for an extra 10 or 15 years. Or squeezing an extra few years out of this life. Or maybe somehow or another uh, missing death this year. But boy, I hope I, I hope I can just make it through this year. Listen, the only reason we have for living another year down here is so that we can preach this book right here and tell somebody about Jesus. Otherwise, there's no reason. You say, well, I just, I'm just afraid that I might uh, catch something and die. Well, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to die if you catch something or not. And I'm not being lighthearted tonight. I'm standing here as a preacher of God's word and I'm saying to God's people, it's time for God's preachers to get their focus back on that book right there and quit worrying about the now and now. The truth of the matter is, hey, when God calls, you're going home. It doesn't matter why you go. God says you're coming home. You don't know. You don't know tonight when your appointment is, but you better, we better be ready. The Bible says, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Amen. You say, well, Ezekiel was dying, or not Ezekiel, Hezekiah was dying, and God gave him an extra 15 years, and you know he flubbed that up. Right. Ahab was going to die, and God extended his life. You think he got better afterwards? He just got worse. He sold himself to do more wickedly. It would have been better off if God would have just let him die. Amen. The longer you live down here, and if you could live a longer time past what time God has for you, you'll probably mess things up more. I'm not sad tonight. My little boy, I don't know what the future held. Now, I couldn't have preserved him. I want to tell you something I never told anybody. When he was a little baby and had to have heart surgery, I prayed, God, don't let me mess things up. Because the doctor said, he's going to have to have heart surgery. And we can save him. We can, we can help him. He's got to do it. But you know, in my heart, my mind, my prayer was, God, I don't want to do something that's contrary to your will. What are you saying? I'm saying I would rather God took my little boy home, our little boy home at two months old and take him to heaven. And to have him grow up and reject Christ and come to an age of understanding and die and go to hell. You say, oh, it's awful. No, what's awful is for someone to die and go to hell. And you think tonight it's not the multitudes of people that are dying. It's the multitudes of people that are dying and going to hell forever and ever. Right. Jesus didn't come so you could live forever. Down here in sin. He comes so that you could die and so that you could be saved and live forever in heaven. You see, death surrounded the birth of Jesus. The Bible talks about it. As far as we know, not one. Well, what was wrong with God? Why didn't he save them? Why did he let that happen? You say, it just wasn't fair, was he? Yeah, he's fair. God's right. 
Say, so why would God let all those little babies die? Because all those little babies that died were growing up in a wicked nation, a godless nation. They just got an advance on heaven, that's all. Amen. And you know what might else have happened? Just to be honest with you, them mothers and fathers might have been, their hearts might have been tenderized a little bit more. They might have, they might have been broken a little bit so that when John the Baptist came along preaching about everlasting life, and don't you think for one minute that John didn't preach that there's life in Christ forever. Sure. And all of a sudden them little mothers and fathers that said, wait a minute, you mean I can see my little baby again? You see, you remember, you remember whenever God said to David, David, your little child, and that wasn't a little baby that he and Bathsheba had. That was a little child, and David had grown to love him. He wasn't a newborn baby. Don't get it wrong. That little child had ran around the palace and sat on David's knee, and David loved that little boy. And God said to him one day, he said, that little boy's going to die. And he fell sick. And David loved that little boy and fell on his face and began to pray. Day after day after day after day after day, finally he realized that something had happened. And he looked up and he saw the servants talking. And they were trying to just figure out, should we tell him or not? Should we tell him? And David was a smart man. He knew what had happened. He says, the child dead? And they said, he's dead. And when, he's, when they announced that, David got up and washed himself. He didn't get mad at God and curse God. He knew that the wages of sin is death. He knew that God had told him. But they said, David, we don't understand this. They said, when the child was alive, uh, you, you wouldn't eat and, and you wept and you fell on your face. But now that he's dead, you clean up and you come and eat. He said, who knows that God might be gracious and merciful? He said, but the truth of the matter is, he said, that little boy will never come to me again. He said, but I shall go to him. Now, I'll tell you something sad. That comforted David. Because David had the assurance in Christ, believe it or not, that he would see that little boy again. He knew that there was a land that's fairer than day. And by faith he could see it afar. And God said, it'll be all right, David. I told you you'd have to lose him, but you didn't lose him. I got him. And you'll see him again. But if, fast forward a few years later, David lost another son named Absalom. And David wasn't comforted. And he said these words about Absalom. He said, Absalom, Absalom, my son, would God I had died. For the Absalom. You know why David said that? Because he knew, in reality, he knew where Absalom was. And tonight, while David's in heaven, that little boy is with him. I believe tonight that the Bible testifies that Absalom most likely is in the torments of hell tonight. You know how long he'll be there? He'll be there forever. You know what? We better, we better get our focus back not on saying, Oh God, save us from death. Oh, God, save us from the affliction. Oh, God, save us from the plague. We better get back to saying, thank God for Calvary. Hey, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for everlasting life. Thank God that there's a hill called Calvary where the Lamb of God died in the place of sinful men. Brother, we're going to die anyway. We better be ready for heaven. Your loved ones tonight, my loved ones, my friends, my neighbors. I had a neighbor today stop, stop me and talk to me. Asked me the time. She said, y'all have church on Thursday. She said, I go to church. She said, but maybe I'll come sometime. I'd like to come. And she said, uh, she said, pray for my husband. She's not saved. You know, I, God's been, put him on my heart. I've been thinking about him. He's a fine man. But I, I, told her, I, I told her, I said, God, I've been thinking about him. I've been waiting for uh, trying to get opportunity. I want to talk to him. That's, that's God reminding him. Say, hey, that's the reason I put you here. You're here to be a witness for me. What's so difficult about it? A bunch of godless uh, scientists, doc, want to stand up and say, we're going we're to protect you, we're going to keep you from dying, do it for the dog, whatever else. I mean, a bunch of nonsense trying to tell people, scare people. Brother, we're going to die. You're going to die someday. You better be ready for heaven. I'm glad tonight for the testimony of those that have died in Christ that are ready for heaven 1 Corinthians 15, 25 says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 
Death is not a friend. God didn't come so that you wouldn't die someday. God's Son, Jesus, came to this earth so that whenever you did have your appointment with death, you could be ready and you could say, Oh, death! Where's your sting? So that you could say, Oh, grave, where's the victory? Hey, so that you could say the sting of death is gone and that we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Jesus Christ made it so that He took the sting out of death and He took the victory away from the grave so that the grave can't hold me. When they came to Curtis Hudson and said, Curtis, you're going to die. He said, not until God tells me, God makes me. He said, that doctor tried to kill me for three years. He said, but they couldn't do it. He said, until God called me home. He said, one day the doctor told him, you need to take, make some arrangements. You need to go out and get you some, a burial plot. He said, so I called my friend and said, hey, I need to go get some resurrection ground picked out. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why is that? Because they got a little further to go than we do. The dead in Christ shall rise first and they that are alive. It might be you, amen. You might be alive at that day. You might wish you wouldn't. But they that are alive and remain shall meet them in the air. And then shall we be with the Lord forever. You know why? Brother, listen. Not because Jesus came to eliminate dying down here. But he came to abolish death. The Bible says, if you'll look it with me, I want you to see it. Look in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 10. 2 Timothy 1, 10. I want you to see this. It's in all of verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Well, I wonder where it comes from. God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. What is the power of God? Who hath saved, saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which, he hath, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world Begin. You see, the plan of God was spawned before the world began. It's a beautiful song, but it ain't so. God didn't search all over heaven to find somebody. He didn't have to search all over heaven. Amen. God was all, Jesus was already willing. He wasn't like King Saul hiding among the stuff. Amen. He was foreordained of God. Can you imagine the the lack of sense or the brainwashing that it takes to convince somebody that there's something they have to do to be saved. There's something that I can do or you can do to add to what Jesus did when it was the eternal plan of God before the world was created. It was ordained of God that Jesus Christ would go to the cross not to stop us from dying, but so that whenever we do die, we can live. You see, I'm born dying. You're born dying. The moment you were born in this world, you were sentenced to die. But after death comes life. You see, we just have a few days down here. And no one wants to leave this world, I understand. We, we don't want to leave our loved ones. I'll never forget uh, Lorraine, I was in the hospital, went to visit Cheryl, and boy, he was he was just worn down and just wore out, and I went in to visit him, and the nurse was there, and they were taking his vitals, you know how they do it, and she was a young nurse, and she was checking here, and then she checked here, and then she checked here, and, and he wasn't panicked, and I wasn't panicked, but I could see the panic on her face. He was talking to me. His eyes were open. He was talking to me, and he said, what's wrong? She said, I can't get a pulse. He said, well, I'm here. He said, I'm talking to you. And she ran out, and she got somebody else to come back in. And she said, find out if he's alive or not. I mean, he, I mean he said, I'm alive. <laughs> and when they got done and got what they needed to get from him, found a pulse, you know. And he lived for a little while after, a good while after that. But he told me, he said, I'm not afraid of dying. He said, I'm ready. He said, now I'll miss that. He said, I don't want to miss things. I understand that. He said, I don't want to miss things. 
He said, I, he said, I think about everybody getting around and doing stuff and I won't be there. He said, that bothers me just a little bit. He said, but I'm not afraid of dying. You know why he wasn't afraid of dying? Because he had trusted Christ as his savior. When I was in Indiana, he got real sick. And I, I, I prayed, I told everybody there, I said, look, pray. I said, my uncle, I said, the man that introduced me to my first love, yellow crooked neck squash, I said, is dying. And I said, no, I, he needs to get saved. I said, I'm going to go home and try to witness to him, but I don't want to go home powerless. I want you all to pray for me. I, he's got to get saved. But you know what? Some rascal beat me to it. His buddy, Eric Williams, his uncle, Anybody think of his name? What's his name? You got his name right now? I can't think of his name right now. He's passed away now. It's right on the tip of my tongue. But he was a soul winning machine. Went to Maranatha out in Sissonville. Witness to everybody. And he said I, he's, he was on his way home. I was on, I was on my way to, from Indiana, but he was, on, he was closer than me. He was in Charleston. And he said, I started to go home. He said, I'd been seeing him that morning. He said, but God told me to go back again that evening, that afternoon, before I went home. And he said, I went back. And he said, and he got saved. He trusted Christ as his Savior. So when I got home, I didn't come home to win him to the Lord. I come home so that he could tell me I'm already saved. And I tell you, there's nothing greater than knowing that heaven is your home. No one likes to die. Death is an enemy. The Bible says so. I don't have to tell you that. B.R. Lakin used to say, there's one thing I want to find out. He said, I want to find out where I'm going to die. He said, no, I'll never go there. <laughs> but you know what? He said, the most dangerous place you go is to bed. He said, because most people die in their sleep. He said, so just don't ever go to bed. But you know what? Someday you're going to leave this world. But as a saved person, we don't have to lament that. Look what the Bible said in 1 Timothy. It says that Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath what? Abolished death. You say, wait a minute, that's not true. Because at his dying, at his birth, all them babies died. You said ever since Jesus went to the cross, there's been millions of people that have died. There's been Christians that were died at the stake. How, how, even when they were writing this in Colossae and Thessalonica and all throughout the first century church, there were Christians dying. So how can that be true? It says, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That word abolish means to render it powerless. The old fella even though the Lord's done abolished him, meaning that he's whipped him. Oh, death, where's your sting? Yep. Hey, grave, where's your, where's your, hey, uh, where, where, where's your victory? You know, the Lord could have just done away with him, and someday he's going to do away with him completely. But the Lord chose fit to leave him as an old specter just to haunt us every once in a while. But as believers, it ought not to haunt us. But death also reminds us of the fact that for the unsaved, that's a real deal. But you know, it's not dying that's what's bad for the lost. It's after that. There are some warped, slanted, lost people that will say, I ain't afraid to die. And maybe they're not. Maybe they, maybe they get enough booze in them. Maybe they get enough dope in them. Maybe their mind is, is, is jaded enough to where they just don't think about it. But if you can get them to think about judgment, because it's not over when you breathe your last breath here. By all means, we know tonight, as believers, it's not over. It just starts. But for unbelievers, it's just getting started. You see, people will say, well, this, this life is hell, but it's not this life, no matter how bad this life is. It doesn't compare to hell. The Bible says in uh, Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 11, it says, he, hath, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Four times God talks about in Revelation the second death. 
In Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. See, you're going to get to heaven one of two ways. One is Christ will return, you'll go home to be with him. The second is you'll die, most likely will die. Jesus didn't come to prevent that first death. But he came so that we didn't have to fear the second death. You see, the first death just an entrance into heaven for me. But, but if I die and I've left undone what needs to be done to stop me from dealing with the second death, and then there's no chance of survival there because it's eternity in hell. The Bible says they have no power over the second death, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 21, 8 says, But the fearful, isn't that something that a man can be fearful and not be saved? You know why he's a fearful man? You know why that tops the list? Because most men, almost all men that died, are afraid to die. But they've been taught the wrong fear. They're afraid of the first death. There's no need to be fearful of the first death. But they've never been taught to fear the second death. The fearful. And then it says unbelieving. And then the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And Jesus didn't come to this earth so that men could live forever down here in this temporal body. He didn't come to stop you from dying. And it's nonsense. You know, you can pray for healing and God might heal someone. And I, right now there are faces of men that, and, and folks here, loved ones, your loved ones, folks that I beg God, please heal them. And some of you, there's been times when it didn't look like you'd make it and we prayed and God said, you know what, I'm going to let them live a little longer. Brother Jay's got a testimony. He, he died twice. twice in one day, but you know, what was sad then, he wasn't saved. He's ready for death now. Amen. 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 You think, can you imagine that? What, no wonder he wants to be a witness for the Lord. No wonder he prays and cares about people because God spared his life. And he knows that, but God spared every one of you and me. I could have died lost. That's why it's so important to get the gospel to young people. To, get them, to let them hear the gospel. I don't understand. I've got friends that want to make the gospel hard. You know, Jesus made all the hard for it. He made all the difficulty for it. We want to have people jump through hoops, do a twisty twir twirl, and do something else, get saved. Listen, for whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, when God takes that verse out of the Bible, then I'll jump up here and holler and tell you you got to weep a, a river of tears to get saved. Amen. But until that verse is in there, then I'm going to say to you, sit down. And stop preaching errors and start preaching the gospel. For whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I went to a funeral once of a dear lady. And I began to count during the course of the sermon of the funeral message. How many ways of salvation the man preached. And I didn't start counting until I realized what he was doing. And I began to listen to all the different assurances of salvation and means of salvation and necessities that he was placing as hurdles to Jesus. And I counted at least 10 different things that stood in the way of a man getting saved that were that man's personal thoughts on salvation. Brother, listen, we better get back to pointing people to Calvary and Christ and nothing else. You don't know when you're going to leave this world, but you better leave ready to meet the Lord. I had a little boy I used to pick up and bring to church named Lel Newland. Lel was the meanest little rascal you ever seen, buddy. He had a mom and dad, and no offense to bikers. 
Uh, but man, they were bikers. They and they had a big old pit bull dog, and he wasn't nice. He was mean as he was a biker. He was a mean rascal. And it's all I could do to get them to let that boy they come to church. And I think they just were glad to get rid of him. They'd kick him out the door, you know. The Catholic priest lived down the street. He had a kid living with him, and the Catholic priest would let me bring his little boy to church. We'd preach the gospel to him in Michigan City, Indiana. The Lord prompted my heart about Lel's parents. I needed to witness to him. But man, every time I'd get there, they'd just barely open the door, shut the door. And so I just kind of relaxed on it. I never, I never bought a newspaper the whole time I was there. One day, I bought a newspaper. I never read the obituary column, but that day I did. And Lel's mother was in there. And the only person that I know that stood between her and eternity was me. And I didn't say a word to her. Now, I could tell you soul-winning stories, but I'm just telling you the truth. As far as I know, that woman died and went to hell. And I never said a word to her to stop it. She was, in her, she was young, much, she's younger than I am now. I never, I never imagined that she would leave this world. But for whatever reason, God had me get a newspaper that day and open the obituary up. And I don't believe it was an accident that God let me look and read her name in there. And realize that she had gone out into eternity. And yet today we have preachers not even preaching. Churches shut down. Because we're, we're afraid someone might get sick and die. Have we lost the reality of hell? Amen. Have we lost the reality and the urgency of the gospel? You see it's sad that I feel uncomfortable preaching this because I'm like an oddball. But it's sad. I can't protect you. I wish I could. But someday you're going to leave this world. You better be ready to meet him. And if you're saved, rejoice in that. But every one of us have someone that we know or that we'll meet along the way that's not saved. And there's no guarantee we have tomorrow to talk to them. Oh, we'll, we'll worry about this temporal body. We'll do all we can to keep this thing alive, knowing that it's going to die. But yet we won't even open our mouth to warn someone of eternity. We won't pray. We wouldn't fast. We wouldn't miss a meal. I'm telling you tonight, there's a God in heaven. You say, well, I, I, it's just too hard to do it. I've got a lot of stuff here, a lot of verses I'd like to look at. I want you to look tonight, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, just for a minute. Hebrews 2, 14. The greatest bondage known to a man is not an alcohol addiction. The thing that brings men into bondage and the thing that is causing men today to throw away their liberties in our nation, in the world. I was reading something, Andrew Steers sent me a message from Australia. The, the, the people in Australia and New Zealand are not even hardly allowed to walk the streets anymore. They're being told they're, they're, they're losing their jobs. It's, it's unprecedented what's gonna happen. The government can't take care of all those people. The country is literally shutting down. Here's why. Hebrews 2.14 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. You see why I hate death? You see, I, the devil ain't all that bad. Well, he's the, he's the one that brought sin to the Garden of Eden. He's the one that lied to Eve and said, Here, partake of this. God doth know the day you eat thereof, that you'll be wise, that you'll be like Him. He's wanting you to miss out something. No, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And here's why. Because once you die, that is the devil, verse 15, 
Jesus came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. You know why the devil wants you to keep you under the bondage and fear of death? Wonder why he wants you to keep you under subject. To, you know why politicians stand up and talk about death and then tell you they can save you from it? Because they're doing the devil's work. They're Satan's disciples. They're his apostles. I like to say that to the governor of New York, uh, talking about her apostles. She and her apostles are de devils. They're not going to save anybody. They're not going to save anybody from the eternal flames of hell, from the second death. Look what it says, subject to bondage. Subject to bondage. Why did Jesus come to deliver us from that? Thank God that he did. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 12. Sometime read First Corinthians and read it slow. Sister Charlotte's husband, Brother Steve, has been four, seven years, eight years this winter, right? Seven years. Coming up on seven years. At Christmas time, he thought he was perfectly well. Maybe he had a few aches and pains. He just thought he was a 60-something-year-old man. But he didn't know that his, it was eaten up with cancer. And didn't plan to have any kind of a funeral service. But before he breathed his last breath, he said, we'll have a memorial service. He said, and the preacher is going to preach 1 Corinthians 15 and preach it on the gospel. And that's what we did per his request. You ought to read 1 Corinthians 15 real slow sometime. I'll not read it all tonight, but look in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Look what the Bible says. And if, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised, and Christ be not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you're yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Jesus didn't come so that you could live down here forever. And if you say, but just having Jesus, that's not enough. A week ago, two weeks ago almost, we loaded up and went to Cloden to the funeral of Sister Miranda Shear. And I watched as Brother Pete, her husband of 22 years, the love of his life came and spoke. And the grace of God gave him the ability to stand there and comfort the people that come to comfort him as he addressed each member of the family. And then her friend spoke, and then the preacher spoke, and then they sang, or the snodgrass sang a song. And all I could think, and of course my heart grieved because of the sadness, but all I could think was how sweet Christianity is. Because though in this hour what the world fears the most, oh, you got cancer, oh, I don't want to hear that. Four years ago she had heard that, and cancer finally had taken its toll and she breathed her last breath. But you know, there was a sweetness there because Jesus took death and abolished it, but he left it around 
as a reminder of why we need him. But you say, but why do we as Christians still have to die? Because he made death something bitter. When they went to the waters of Mar, they had to drink. But the water was so bitter that they got angry. And he told Moses, he said, take a tree and throw the tree in the water. And when he threw the tree in the water, the water became sweet enough to drink. You know, Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. When you throw the cross into the bitter waters of death, death becomes sweet. Amen. 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 We'll see our loved ones again. We rejoice in that. Look what he said. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, not by God, it was not God's design, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign. To he put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You think about that. All the time, all the time that the Lord gave us Luke, we fought to keep him alive. He couldn't eat. The crazy cardiologist's heart died. Say, oh, he's okay. They had already told us he had holes in his heart, you know, and, and they'll say, well, we don't know why he won't eat. We don't know why he won't latch on. We don't know why he won't. He's not gaining any weight. So they had a tube down his throat, and we'd feed him, and Jess would go and feed, try to feed him and try to nurse him. We'd pray, and everybody prayed. And, and uh, man, Luke just cut in. And uh, one day, uh, he, man, he, 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 a thousand times, we, you know, we didn't know if he was going to make it through the day. This had happened, that had happened. <clears throat> I had to build fences for him, build gates for him. One day, Harold hollered, old neighbor, he, he, the girls had left the upstairs port. He's out there dangling his feet over the edge of the balcony, you know. I mean, just everything in the world, just tempting death. But, you know, despite all of my best efforts and all of our best efforts, one night, Caleb carried him up the steps to take him to bed. And he waved goodbye. Now I feel like in my heart he knew he was going to be with the Lord. He had a good day at church that day. He wasn't feeling bad. He just knew it was, he was just going home. You might think I'm crazy, but I think he went outside to tell that old dog goodbye. He went by me, buddy, like a bullet. When I was patting, never have done that. Where I said, come on, man, we can talk to the dog later. But he knew it was the last time he'd see his old buddy. Down. So the Lord took him home that night. Man, that hurts. But you know what? I'll see him someday. And when I see him, there won't be any problems of the flesh. He'll be just like Jesus. He might have to introduce himself to me, but I'll know him. Amen. Like the old preacher said, I hate to think we'll be dumber then than we are now when we're perfect. Amen. Amen. God told uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Lazarus and his sisters, he said, your brother will rise again. Amen. David said, I, I, little boy, I, I won't be able to bring him back to me, but I'll go to him. Amen. When Jesus said, Lazarus, well, wait a minute, he'd been dead four days. You mean he still knew his name? Yep, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. There is a land that's fairer than day, and by faith, we can see it afar. We've been lulled into, and I want you to realize, that we've been lulled into in America thinking that the doctors and the this and our education can keep us alive forever and so we prop each up we prop ourselves up on medications and pills and everything else and i'm and that's wonderful i like to see your smiling faces 
I love it. But you know why you got up this morning? Because God gave you life. And when the first morning when God says that's it, you'll be more alive then than you are now. And we'll be with the Lord in glory. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Amen. That day's coming for us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, there's no way tonight that I could exhaust all there is to say. Someone, Lord, might read that story and wonder and say, why in the world? You could have saved all them little children, but God, you did save them all. You saved them all when you saved that one. When you saved Jesus, not from death, but when you preserved him alive until it was time to die. Then you did save all them little children. And you made a way for every little child that was born before or after to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you tonight, Lord. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to be more burdened than ever for the lost. God, help us to, Lord, to take it personal. And Lord, thank you for life. And thank you for the everlasting life, most of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Listen, I want to say again. I want to share a story with you from the Word of God on a, on a great story. If you've listened to this message or if you've ever listened to a message concerning the gospel, you know that the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that a man's lost in his sin. We're born, uh, we're born sinners. The Bible says that all have sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You understand that. And I, I'm certain that, that you don't have to have someone uh, to convince you of the fact that you've sinned. You can go back. You say, well, I'm not a bad sinner. But the, the Bible doesn't say the wages of sin for a bad sinner is hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've listened to, the, listened to this message, you've heard about the second death. And uh, certainly, certainly you don't want to you don't want to die and they have to endure the eternal damnation of hell. You don't want to have to go to hell and endure the second death and suffering and lamentation and weeping. And that's a, that's a real place. Hell is a real place. You don't want to go there. There's an incredible story in the book of Acts where the apostle Paul, one of God's great apostles, one of God's great men, he and his friend Silas were taken and arrested and put in prison for preaching the gospel. The Bible says that at midnight, Paul and Silas were in Acts chapter 16, that uh, they were uh, that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And then the Bible says, and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners that were there heard them. And then the Bible says that suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. So every man in that prison, including Paul and Silas, had the privilege and the opportunity to go out of that prison and do as they wished. But the, in the incredible thing is that none of them left. None of them. The, the Bible says in verse 27 of Acts chapter 16 that the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So rather than be suffer a trial or whatever else or be embarrassed in front of his peers for losing all the prisoners, knowing that you couldn't explain what had happened to them, knowing that they probably would take his life, he just determined he'd take his own life. But Paul uh, cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Well, then the Bible says he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and the keeper of the prison fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So now the keeper of the prison uh, falls down before the prisoners and he says to them, what must I do to be saved? You know, before the, this man fell asleep, he must have heard, he must have heard the singing. He must have heard the prayers. No doubt he saw the testimony of these men and he realized that these men were not like other men. These men knew something that no other men he'd ever met knew. And these men knew the Lord Jesus Christ and they weren't afraid to die. They weren't, they weren't worried about the prison. Uh, certainly they had feelings. Certainly they had aches and pains, but they knew that there was something far better. They had assurance and confidence and hope beyond this life 
And uh, this prison keeper, all he had uh, it was, was this life and then death and thinking that if he killed himself, it would all be over with. But, but through the singing and, and, and through the, the testimony of Paul and Silas, and maybe he had heard the preaching previously, but whatever it was, God had already gotten hold of his heart and caused him to realize, you know, uh, yes, you can take your life and end this life, but the reality is uh, there's a possibility. The reality in his mind was that, that there is something afterwards. And so he cried, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't talking about being saved from temporal death, from, from, from physical death. He was talking about being saved from the eternal damnation, from the eternal fires of hell. He had heard about it. And listen, you've heard about hell and you've heard the gospel, and you've heard the preaching, and you know that there's a place called hell. The Bible says that hell is a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, and you need to be saved just like I had to get saved, and just like every other person that will be in heaven one day had to get saved. They had to be born again. They had to trust Christ, and somebody wants to make hell, uh, uh, they wants to make heaven a, a, a difficult attainment so that there's something you have to do or something I have to do or, or there's, some, there's something that I have to do. People talk about easy believism. They make a statement like that. And friend, I hate even bring that up, but I want to tell you that Jesus Christ paid the price on, paid the penalty on Calvary so that you could be saved. The Bible doesn't make it difficult for a sinner to be saved. The Bible makes it easy for a sinner to be saved. If you're lost on your way to hell and you realize that you don't want to spend eternity in that place of suffering and endure the second death forever and ever and ever, and you realize that the Bible is right and that Jesus did die for your sins and heaven can be your home. You don't have to die and go to hell. You don't have to suffer forever in the torments of hell. You can be saved. This jailer said, what must serve? What must I do to be saved? What must I do? And the answer came from the mouth of Paul and Silas in verse 31 of Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The Bible records that they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house, in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his house straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Man, I'm telling you, listen, it's a wonderful thing to be saved. Here's a man that was lost on his way to hell and going to take his life. And within just a few hours, he's, he and his family, they're cleaning these men up. And, they, and they're preaching the word of God to the family. And the whole family hears the gospel. And the family believes the report of God's men concerning the gospel. And they trust Christ. And now this family, whereas once they were lost, now they're found. They were blind. Now they see. And God's amazing grace has come to the home of this jailer. And this jailer is saved and his whole house has heard the gospel preached to them. And now they're saved. Thank God for the gospel. If you've heard this message or you've heard some other message along the way and God's let you know that you need to be saved. Why in the world aren't you saved already? Why don't you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? Trust Christ. Know that heaven is your home. Trust him today. Don't wait. Don't delay. Listen, get to somebody, get to, get to church, get, get to somebody and let someone open the Bible and show you how to be saved. You can call us. The phone number is 304-542-2213. 304-542-2213. We don't want anything from you, but the opportunity to make sure to tell you, to make sure you know Jesus Christ is your savior. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Let someone tell you how to be saved. God bless you.